So hello, everyone. Um, this is Shannon Vance Ocampo, and I use uh, she, her pronouns. I'm the General Presbyter of the Presbytery of Southern New England, and this is Connecting Our Conversations, our podcast space for conversations that push the edges of our faith and help us to deepen discipleship. The Presbytery of Southern New England is a regional governing body in the Presbyterian Church, USA. Uh, today for our podcast, we are welcoming uh, the Reverend Jenny Peak, who is the Associate University Chaplain at Yale University and Associate Pastor at the University Church at Yale, along with Leah Miller, who's a member at First Presbyterian in New Haven, Connecticut, and Ellen McDonald, who is a member at First Presbyterian in Stamford, Connecticut. All three of them are involved in Presbyterian Promise, which is an LGBTQIA plus nonprofit and advocacy group in our presbytery. And we wanted to have them on our podcast this month as we celebrate Pride Month since it's June. So welcome Jenny, Leah, and Ellen to uh, Connecting Our Conversations. It's so great to have all of you here. So welcome. Thank you. It's good to be Thank here. You. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. So I thought we'd get started with just introduction. So I will let each of you introduce yourselves however you'd like to and just Tell us a little bit about who you are and what brings you here to the podcast. I can Jenny, start. You're going to go first. Yeah, sure. Um, good to have you all with us. Uh, I'm Reverend Jenny Peak. Uh, you can call me Jenny. I use she, her pronouns. And yes, I live in New Haven. This is my 10th year here. Um, I came here first to go to Divinity School at Yale Divinity School. And since then, I've been working um, for Yale University as an associate chaplain and associate pastor on campus. But I hail originally from Colorado Springs, Colorado. I went to college in Iowa, lived in DC, and I just keep going further east. But um, I'm really glad to call Connecticut home for almost a decade now. I got involved in Presbyterian Promise when I was a student in around 2016, and uh, soon after that joined the board when I graduated, and for a few near years now have been serving as co-moderator. Um, but I'm very glad to be here and glad to be engaging in this discussion, uh, and I'll pass it to Ellen to introduce herself. Hi, everybody. I am Ellen. I use she, her pronouns. I have three adult children, and my youngest kid uh, identifies and is in the queer community. I am a member of Presbyterian Church First Pres in Stamford and have served on the board of Presbyterian Promise for a chunk of years. It's pre-COVID, so, I, you know, it started before COVID, so we're at at least, you know, six years because I was on for a few of those, and and as you may uh, or may not know, uh, Stamford First uh, has, has a long history, as many others do in this presbytery in this work in support uh, and love of our LGBTQIA plus community. And I'm happy to be here. And that leaves me. So hi, everyone. I'm Leah. Uh, use she, her pronouns. Uh, I'd like to say I was born into and raised by the Pres First Presbyterian Church in New Haven. Um, so a lifelong member there. Uh, and I got involved. I got invited directly into the board uh, probably three or four years ago. And then somehow within a year of that ended up as co-moderator with Jenny. <laughs> uh, and it's, it's been a fun <laughs> ride. So looking forward to plenty more prides and plenty, plenty more years, um, with Prez Prom. Great. So, um, you all have said a little bit, um, about, uh, sort of your origin stories, but I bet that there's more there about, why it is um, LGBTQIA plus advocacy and ministry in the church um, is important to you. So um, whatever other pieces you want to share with us about why you've been involved in this work, what it means to you, um, you know, where you go with it in your personal life and in your personal, um, you know, uh, walk of faith. I can start. Uh, yeah. prior, prior to my own kid coming out as queer, I have four female cousins on one side of my family and three out of four of them are gay. And so um, grew up in, in embracing my cousins and the loves of their families and 
um, went to one of my cousin's uh, weddings in Seattle, Washington, when my youngest was four years old, and we all signed a document. It was an illegal wedding, and uh, and we all signed a document that made this, you know, someday be able to be a marriage recognized by the the state of Washington, uh, and it is. And uh, and my cousin was just telling me today that that document is still, you know, hanging on the wall in their house. This, you know, just embracing of love of family and friends who said we're not going to tell the government. We're not going to allow the government to tell us what love is. Um, so I've been in that way before my own child uh, came out as queer. Yeah, thanks, Ellen. Thank you. Leah or Jenny, what first drew you into this work or why are you in it today? I can go, I can go next. This is Jenny. Um, you know, I, I, I could say way too much about this, so I'll try to limit myself. But um, I grew up, like I said, in Colorado Springs, Colorado. And went to a Baptist church. I didn't find the Presbyterians till I was in college actually. And um, and then when I was in high school, I got really involved in the Fellowship of Christian Athletes and they were a great community for me for many ways, um, but taught that homosexuality was a sin and um, a number of other things um, were wonderful for my faith in some ways in terms of uh, like diving deeply with scripture and um, really learning, I think I credit the Baptist with teaching me that Jesus is my friend, that Jesus loves me and cares about me, um, and that personal relationship uh, with Christ and that God, with God, and that we're important and beloved. Um, but internalized a lot of narratives around homosexuality being a sin, and um, was also taught things like don't kiss until your wedding day. So it was that that stream of um, Christianity and. It was my senior year when one of my best friends came out to me and I um, actually she didn't come out to me. She said, what do you think about gay people? Um, and I said, oh, you know, love the sin or hate the sin. Um, and I've come to regret that um, uh, for, for a number of reasons, but it was what I knew. Um, and so she waited a few more years to actually come out to me at that point. But her asking me that question really planted a seed of what do I think about that and why do I think that? And started asking mentors at that time. The mentors I knew to ask were involved in the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Um, but when I went to college, I was suddenly around lots of different kinds of Christians and lots of different kinds of people, was suddenly around um, LGBTQ people that were out and happy and healthy and living lots of different kinds of lives that I hadn't seen before. And it was when I was in college, I also fell um, Fell, fell for a girl and realized, oh, um, I'm a part of this community as well. <laughs> and um, uh, uh, this, this is a part of my story too and went on my own journey with that. But I'm grateful for um, the mentors and it was the Presbyterian pastor in my college that had an affirming theology um, and the chaplain at my college also was a lesbian. And so she was the first, they were the first women clergy I also came to know and interact with and through them just opened me up to the idea that I can be deeply rooted in scripture and deeply faithful and also an out lesbian. Um, and uh, there's more to say about that, but that was the start of my journey. And then it was through there that I realized that there's so many people that the church misses, uh, queer people, trans people, um, but also survivors of crime and sexual assault and uh, people of color and just realizing that Jesus had a lot to say about the folks on the margins and that included me, but others. Um, and that's where Presbyterianism really came alive for me um, and then found my way to Div School and, and here, but working with LGBTQ people and helping them know that they are beloved, important, and called and claimed as they are, um, I received and I try to pass on however I can, which is why I uh, really spend a lot of time with Presbrom. Thanks, Jenny. Thank you for that. Uh, for, for me, my journey with this... Um started in high school when I first identified as part of the LGBTQIA community. Um, I actually had a similar situation where a friend of mine was like, what do you think about this? And I had that thought of like, oh, no, that makes sense. Okay. Um, and, but I, I had the great fortune of growing up in a very open and affirming church. Everyone's loved, everyone's accepted, you know, First President New Haven was one of the founding member churches of Presbyterian Promise. And a lot of the church members and the pastors over the years have been very um, just accepting and loving. Um, and so I kind of 
might be a unique side of the board in coming from a very loving Christian uh, community. Uh, and I, it, it's very easy to forget that, that that's not always what people come from. And it, it is always so sad, but refreshing to, to meet people at like prides that did not have that experience. Um, and, and so that's kind of where I come from, uh, as a board member on Presbyterian Promise is just to make sure that more people can have that open and affirming and loving community experience. Yeah. Thank you for that, Leah. You know, it's so interesting as I listen to your stories and the touch points and um, having known each of you for a little bit of time and, but also realizing there's a lot, you know, we don't know about each other. Right. And so it's really interesting to hear these stories and these pieces of testimony. And there's a lot, Leah, that you just said that resonates with me because my home church decided I was actually an elder on session in high school when a big ch suburban church outside of Philadelphia and our senior pastor just was at the time that was when this movement was really gaining some steam in the late 80s early 90s in the PCUSA and the, the what they did then was the tall steeple churches banded together and formed the covenant network um, and put, you know, their leadership names and sort of the gravitas of being the, the, the big churches in the denomination or some of them behind that. And that was one form of using power and directing it in a, in a, in a way. And I remember when my home church did that and our senior pastor preached a sermon, um, which I still keep in my desk drawer, actually, um, the, the sermon where he discussed why he was doing that. And the congregation gave him a standing ovation. But I also know from talking to my parents that, you know, people left, of course, as well. Um, but it was a real turning point in the life of our congregation. And it also, like, made me wake up and realize, oh, the church can be in these, you know, activist spaces when I was a junior in high school, beginning to realize that. And that got me interested more, actually, in, like, what's this church stuff about? Like, it wasn't just anymore like oh my parents take me every Sunday to this place but like oh this might be relevant this might have something here for me and um but then beginning to realize as I went to college the opposite right Jenny from you like there was this conservatism that I didn't understand and know about because I'd been in sort of the opposite bubble right and so I had to like realize there were other people out there in a different it was sort of like that opposite experience uh from what you're saying you know Jenny and I, I remember many times calling home and saying I didn't know people were like this, or I didn't know this was going on. You know, uh, so it's it's interesting, like those early formation pieces and where they take us and how we how we move from there. So I'm grateful for the, those stories, and then and of course also how we nurture next generations, right, and love them. So it's a it's a it's all these sort of intertwined pieces. So so you know, in our presbytery, of course, we've had this group Presbyterian Promise for a long time. And um, it's been the focal point for a lot of this advocacy and ministry, uh, you know, around the queer community for a long time. And so I thought, um, you know, maybe not everybody knows the origin story or the history of it. And um, so I thought we'd, we'd just talk a little bit about that. Like, you know, what is Presbyterian Promise? What is their story? How'd they get going? All of those things. So I, I know, Jenny, you've got um, a little bit of like the history, and I'd love to, to hear some of that and as we share it during Pride Month. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I'll try to speak on behalf of the um, elder and elders and clergy and members who started it since I wasn't there, but it's 1999. So we're celebrating our 25th anniversary this year, uh, which is amazing to believe. And it really started with a group of faithful people who were troubled by how um, they were seeing LGBTQ people be treated by the church and also deeply moved by the faithfulness of the LGBTQ elders and clergy um, and people and allies among them, uh, realizing that there was this call to serve that the church wasn't seeing and wasn't recognizing. And also this history of service that had been happening since the beginning of the church by um, lesbian and gay and trans people uh, over the ages that went um, unnoticed or, or, or covered up. And so in 1999, um, this group of elders and clergy formed Presbyterian Promise and formalized it um, to be an advocacy group that would 
be helping to organize uh, the Presbytery of Southern New England in our efforts to make it so that the ordination and marriage of LGBTQ people could be a part of our church. And uh, many of the people that were involved in those early days are still here. Um, our, I think about our board members, uh, Dick Hasbany and Keith Roden. I think about many of our members who have been on the board um, at various points, uh, Ralph Jones, Pat Wales, um, Jane Hindenlang. There's too many to name, um, but folks that uh, from a place of their faithfulness and boldly observing how the spirit was moving among them knew that it was time to help organize. And so as Presbyterians do, uh, they wrote <laughs> letters and they wrote, um, they you know gathered uh, or organized across the different churches um, and had lots of meetings with lots of food and lots of prayer um, to really think about what can we do to help um, to help spread the good word. One of my favorite stories is uh, Janie Spar, uh, to me a, a, a legend in the Presbyterian world, um, also a lesbian woman who was a card carrying lesbian evangelist. <laughs> um, uh, you know, at the time, I, I think about my my young self at the time who could never could have imagined that. Um, but the support that she and others received um, and the courage it took for out LGBTQ people at that time to go and share their testimonies and and not know how they'd be received or um, how they'd be questioned, but to say, hey, this is my story, this is my truth. Um, to me, it harkens back to the Ethiopian eunuch um, in Acts, the book of Acts um, that said, I feel called, I feel moved by this text, by this God, by this word, um, in the fullness of who I am, what is to prevent me? Um, from being baptized, uh, what is pr to prevent me from being a full member in the ways that I feel called. And so 25 years later, uh, much many good things have happened, as we know, um, in 2011, and then in 2014, uh, our church moved to bless the ordination and marriage of queer people. And uh, all three of us, Ellen, Leah, and I joined post this. And um, since that time, Presbyterian Promise has been deeply committed to our presence at Pride. And maybe I'll let uh, Ellen or Leah take it from here to speak to what, what, what our focus and mission is now. All right, I can take take some of that. So um, what, what we, what we work on now is 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 keeping that that present. So as she said, it's it's Pride Month, right? And turns out that uh, Pride goes beyond a month, and so do the events that call themselves, you know, Pride Pride Month events. Um, and and we focus that time of year around being a presence at each of these events, right? As many as we can get to in Southern New England, so that anyone who happens to show up at a Pride event can learn and know that God loves all of them their whole selves and that there are churches that will welcome them with open arms and say, come on in, you know, we, we are all one in Christ Jesus, let's go. Um, and so we do that. And other times of the year, we focus on making direct connections with different churches, churches that might wish to become officially a sponsoring church of Presbyterian Promise or have questions around how can they talk about um, transgender issues with their church. And we try to reach out to them Another thing that we do is we curate a, a book list, which may sound odd, but one of the things we've learned is that those who are trying to learn don't necessarily want to walk into a bookstore and go to the gay section and be seen in the gay section, right? So, so we curate a whole list of, of books. And this year at Pride, we um, have been blessed with enough funding to be able to give some of those books away um, at our Pride events. So that's a new thing that we're doing this year. Leah, I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, I mean, so this year, like you said, we we focused very heavily on on the books that we have. So, um, the the three books that we we focused on, we chose you know kind of prayerfully as a as a board. Um, the first is Heather has two mommies, which is a kids book, and it's it's not Christian in any way, but it is very joyfully queer. Um, we actually had Liz Leah Newman. Uh, the author of Heather Has Two Mommies at our as a, the speaker at our our annual meeting this year, um, which was was really great to hear uh, about her work and her advocacy in the community. Um, but that that book is coming on I think thirty five years now, and it was one of the first books to be banned um, just for a preschooler who has two moms. Um, the the second book 
uh, is more teen oriented um, and, and talks about, you know, what Christianity and queerness means uh, to, to the teen life and, and, and who people are during their discovery. Um, and the, the third book is, is on the adult so side. We kind of spanned the ages uh, called God versus Gay, and it's very scripture based, actually written by a rabbi. Um, and, and Jenny Peek's actually the one that brought this one up as one of her favorites um, to, to read and, and to discuss and kind of show like, no, the, the Bible says <laughs> everyone is loved and accepted and, and there is no, no issue or, or contest there. Um, but so that's, that's been wonderful to be able to, to give those out because um, we normally have at our table a, a, a healthy, essentially library of books. Um, and we encourage people to pick them up, leaf through them, take pictures if they're interested, but unfortunately not for sale. And, and this, this summer we've, we've had the, the, the true fortune of being able to have people walk away with something tangible that, that, that they can relate to and connect to and read through. Um, and, and I think that's, that's been great. And in the past and, and still this summer, um, one of our big things is uh, we have scarves that are in rainbow pattern and, and more recently trans colors, trans flag colors, um, lovingly and prayerfully knitted by members of our churches. Um, every year uh, the collection grows and every year we try to give out as many as we can. And it's, it's truly a blessing to see someone be embraced uh you know with something so lovingly and handmade that you know you can tell it makes a difference and you can tell that there's an impact that this is you know not quite a prayer shawl it, it is a scarf but there there is that that comparison that that impact and so that's that's been our main you know impact and focus during pride and during pride month um we usually go to four to six a year. Um, so, so far this year, uh, we went to Hamden, uh, Norwalk, Fairfield, um, Rhode Island. Uh, this weekend on the 22nd is West Hartford. And then come September, we'll also be tabling at Hartford and New Haven Prides. Um, and there's plenty more prides and at this point it's it's too many to attend <laughs> um but it it really is great to know that pride is is spreading <laughs> um and and being you know more embraced is is just is just really great and that we get to table and have a presence like they've both said to have a presence and and to show that you know Christians love everyone. God loves everyone. There is a community if, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, and I, I think that's just wonderful. Yeah, it's really great. And it's, it, you know, it's such a great form of evangelism to just be present and be joyful and be available for conversation with people. Um, and also to be welcoming new people. in. I've heard from, um, some of the pastors of churches that have recently joined Prez Promise over the last few years and how excited they've been to have their congregations join and also then get to do things like table with all of you at pride and events and go to things. And it's just been good. And they're excited that there's like, you know, still opportunity to join in, you know, um, that, that there's, there's still that welcome and that opportunity. I also remember even before I served this presbytery running into your folks, some of those elders, Jenny, you were naming at general assemblies of the past when, you know, we were working in 2010 and 2014 on changes to the book of order and, um, being in committee with those folks and folks from around the country, you know, and, uh, that that witness at General Assembly. So it, it was, you know, fun when I got here that I already knew some people. And it was it was through some of that GA advocacy work in that and in some other, you know, spheres around the church. Um, and it's that that connectional piece is always uh so nice. And it's also um really exciting. I remember when um JC was called to New Haven, um, also just as I was arriving, I remember some of those elders being present that day and really being um, tearful about it and saying, we worked so hard for this at GA, but we didn't know if we'd get to see it happen 
in action at like our church, right? Like we didn't know if we'd get to see it like in that way, like the, from the big picture to the local congregation and just, you know, being able to, to see some of that has been, you know, over the arc of the movement, right. Is, is really, um, you know, still gets me very teary when I think about it because it's uh, very special and important and it, you know, just shows the work that we need to keep working on. So, yeah. So thank you all for this witness. Cause it's not been just in this presbytery. It's been throughout the denomination. I just want to say that as someone who's been here seven years, but also knew about all of you before I got here, right. From other work. So, so we've touched on, you know, some of the, the pieces around pride month, but talk, talk a little bit about how it manifests itself, not just so much in being out in the larger community, but, you know, getting back down to the, the local, you know, congregations, how does it show up at, you know, first Stanford, how does it show up at first New Haven? How does it show up in campus ministry at Yale, like talk about that that local, hyper-local work that's going on in those local spaces and ministries um, and, and some of that and what, what that looks like, maybe how it's evolved and where it's at today, where you hope it's going. I can start with uh, with Stanford uh, first. We had, we had a moment where we needed to replace our sign, right, out, out front. And this was maybe six, years ago or so and I was on session at the time and had said to to our pastors well hey let's let's put a rainbow on the sign and they said why I said so people will see it when they drive by and because they had had the long-standing experience of being in the church said everybody knows you know that we're that we're welcoming and affirming and I said not the people who've moved in in the last 15 years right um and having that reawakening right that recognition of we know our history, we know what we were doing in 1999 when we voted, you know, for Wayne Osborne to serve as an elder in our church, um, and but not not the people, you know, who are who are walking around Stanford now and wondering, will I be accepted at that church? Um, so such a simple thing, but that we needed to reclaim. Right after the hard work and and the break of the you know after the winds right of the you know, 2011 and 2014 saying so, you know, we gotta we gotta make sure we're still telling that story so a simple example but of something that that we did um, and that has has shown benefits you know so that we now have you know more gay couples in in our church we have trans people in our in our church um, and and just making that more overt. Our most recent call of associate pastor, when she came uh, during the interview process with her wife to, to visit with us, and it was right around Christmas time, and my husband was on the, the committee, so we did a dinner, right, at, at somebody's house. And, and Shelly tells this story quite often that after she left, she and her wife uh, looked at each other like, are these people for real? Like they didn't care. Like they're like, oh, you have a wife. Okay, bring her. Like that's what we do. Um, and and getting to that place of that's not actually what we focus on when we're looking for a pastor. Your sexuality is not what we need to have as part of your interview process. Um, was another key, I think, time for us as a church to to be able to to call Shelley and say, yeah, that's fine. You know, we're we're good. Let's let's be let's be in community together and to watch then um the newer members of our congregation come in and, and be able to see her right, in her ministry and feel very welcomed by everyone you know that they come in contact with has been really really fun to see over these last few years it's a great story thanks ellen mm -hmm. both of them mm -hmm. thank you i can jump in yeah as a chaplain um who works with college students i i think it's easy and pastoring a church too, it's easy to, as Ellen said, think about the people that are in the pews and their stories, but we can forget about all the people that aren't in the pews that would long to be, um, that we need to seek out and find um, and, and bring in personally. And I think working with college students, um, there are our, our numbers for students interested in religious life at Yale have skyrocketed since COVID. Um, that there is a real hunger um, and I think response to the isolation and loneliness of COVID that hit these young people when they were in high school and for our grad students when they were in college um, that really, I, I think, desire um, 
not answers, but relationship and engagement with deep questions um, that lead to uh, more community and relationship. And, you know, I, at my church, um, I pastor the university church at Yale, um, I'd say about half of our students identify as LGBTQ. Um, and uh, it's, I, I think with each of them, they walk in and, and maybe a few of them are Leahs of the world that have been raised in churches that uh, have embraced LGBTQ people across their lifetime, but most of them have not. For most of them, it's a very, very new idea. Even folks that have been raised in blue, blue New England, um, you know, people don't think that Christianity accepts not in the discourse. We get drowned out by everything else. And so um, I think honestly, that's one of my favorite things about being at Pride is the testimonies that are shared and the people that are moved by our presence there. Um, I'm struck with the these scarves that we give away. It's always the awkward teenager that goes for it. Um, you know, that, and, and I say awkward in a very endearing way. It's the teens that are anywhere from like 14 to 20 years old. And every year we've had them come back and say, you know, your scarf is hanging above my bed from last year, or I remember seeing you last year. And, um, thank you so much for that scarf. Like that was the first trans thing that I ever wore. Um, and, and so I, I think that relationship, I mean, at pride giving away some of these books, um, it moves people to see that not only are, you know, lots of churches say you're welcome, but the fact that we're leaving our church doors and saying you matter enough that we are going to be here and we're not going to expect anything of you and we're not going to ask anything of you, but we're here to testify to the fact that our love of God is so deep that we love creation so deeply that includes you that we want to be here um, to say happy pride and to say um, that you and your family is beautiful and to give you a book um, and to be there, be there to answer questions. Um, so I, I think we can do, as Ellen said, I think we have all been through our own journey with this and sometimes we forget that there's lots that are falling through the cracks and are left behind and are hungry and really just need someone to directly say, I see you, I love you, I want you to be here. And that can make all the difference. And that made all the difference for me. I can say, um, I very much felt like I had to choose between being a lesbian and being gay uh, or being a lesbian and being Christian, that those were the two options. And both would have left me unhappy if I had walked away from either. And it was only because there were some Presbyterians and some UCC folks that said, hey, I see you and and you belong here and that's why i'm here um and so just trying to pass that on thanks jenny yeah in the new haven area i mean our our church um has been as active as as we can be in obviously we're involved in presbyterian promise but also other outreach um a lot of folks during COVID actually joined our church because, um, as some folks might know, we had the giant "No Justice, No Peace" sign out front of our church, um, and and you know we've discussed since since that came down what what other messages do we want to give, um, and so one of our, our rotational banners uh, is you know accepting of all. Um, I I don't remember exactly what phrasing or, or what scripture we use, but, you know, just being visible, uh, like Ellen said, you know, to us internally, we know <laughs> that we're open and affirming and we're accepting, um, but others might, might not know, um, or might not realize. Um, and, and so, you know, a couple of weeks ago, one of the first weekends in, in June, our, uh, faith formations, uh, minister, preached about, you know, what pride means to the community um, and and what we can do as a church and as as individuals. Um, and we we had some kind of like workshopping activities after church that day, which was was really nice and meaningful. But there's there's always more to do, right? We we can talk, we can preach, we can see you know, go out into the community and, and see people at Pride and, and make meaningful connections. And, and there's always just more. <laughs> um, and it, it's great to be involved in that. 
Thanks, Leah, for that. That leads me into, you know, one of my, one of the questions about, you know, we've done so much advocacy over the years, you know, we referenced the 2010 and the 2014 General Assembly when, um, you know, we got to um, ordination and to marriage being, um, you know, open in the PCUSA. And um, I know there's some overtures headed to the General Assembly actually even next week to continue to expand our witness and our openness uh, in the church, and we'll see what happens with those, right? You know, there's, we're, we're back to having um, some things on the docket for the assembly next week. But, you know, it's a reminder that there's, there's more, always more to do. And so, as you imagine the church, you know, what it used to be, and uh, what it is today, you know, what do you think that there are things that are undone in the church and things that we need to be uh, looking at related to the queer community, related to pride, related to welcome and inclusion what's what's undone and and where what's where are the places of of new opportunity that you see springing up i'd be happy to start i think that when we look at the lgbtq acronym the t is where the work needs to be done right now um i think there's there's a lot of things that individual churches and the pcusa can be doing uh to affirm our transgender brothers and sisters and siblings um uh, you walk into our churches, a lot of them were built a really long time ago, and the only bathrooms are male and female. So where do our non-binary people, you know, even just use a restroom, right, in our in our old churches? Do we even think about these things? The language that we use, and um, we call, you know, well, instead of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, do we use parent, child, and Holy you know, Spirit? Um, so there are language choices that are more inclusive, um, and, and physical space issues that, that we need to figure out how to, to have all feel that they can, they can, you know, be witness there. And I think there's also a lot of educational pieces that we as Pres Prom might be able to help churches as they try to navigate. How do we greet someone? How do we have conversations at coffee hour? Uh, where typically when someone says, oh, I have two children, the typical follow-up is, you know, boys or girls, sons or daughters, right? It's just how we are as a community um, in, in talking in a very wonderful wanting to include way. But as soon as we, as we gender that question, um, we're making someone make a stand in that moment. Do I call my trans son, my son or my daughter? And, you know, there, there are all sorts of challenges um, that we inadvertently exclude members of the trans community based on our history of language use that I'd love to see our churches continue to work on. Yeah, I think that's definitely a big one, Ellen, today in the church. I think piggybacking on that, that you know, the transgender community is just being attacked in an unprecedented way by our legislatures and by our local, it's in the local school boards and, you know, books like uh, libraries are a big forefront right now of trying to preserve having books in them that are, are about LGBTQ stories, about trans stories, about people of color and history. And and so I, I think sometimes it can feel so enormous that there's, well, there's the presidential election but there's local politics at play that I think we all can be aware in our communities of, you know, what are our friends and coworkers saying about trans people, about trans people in sports, about, um, you know, trans bathrooms, that there's a lot of misinformation out there and there's a lot of fear and there's a lot of scapegoating. And I think, and there's just a lot of silence where people are either afraid of saying the wrong thing or, you know, just aren't being very thoughtful and kind of accept narratives that are given to them. And so I would love to see church being a space um, where people can come and say, you know, I'm afraid because my nephew is trans and um, he's a soccer player and he's not being allowed to play. And I don't know what to do about that. Or, um, you know, where where we can talk about these things openly, because I think there's still a lot of invisible things that happen. And so I think including um, trans people and the prayer concerns, uh, having pastors preach telling stories that include LGBTQIA stories, like you just never, there's always a stranger at church and you don't know the story they have or the stories of their communities. And I think also recognizing that it literally saves lives. And I don't, 
that is a dramatic thing to say, but it is true um, that we are losing um, precious, precious children um, and adults, many of whom are trans, but also others who are LGBTQ, um, who don't think that there's a place for them and think that there's something wrong with them and and we lose them. And so I, I think realizing that a lot of times um, when you think about who's in the pews around you, um, imagine when we think about like the saints, <laughs> the, the cloud of witnesses that, that keep them in your cloud uh, as you are serving one another and, and telling stories and paying attention because they are there. Um, and, and the more that we, uh, I'm cisgender, the more that we name it and, and leave space for it, they will emerge and what good news and life and ideas and witness and to testimony they bring. Um, but we have to have more comfort and willingness to also step up and take risks on their behalf. Thanks, Jenny. And I, I think that another part of advocacy is self-knowledge, right? So I think one of the big one of the big issues with the queer community is the burden is put on queer people to educate others. And it should not be that way. While it's true that, you know, queer people are more often happy to, to teach and, and show, it, it should not be the burden on the queer community. It, it really should be those who are allies and supportive, and even those who aren't, to just learn, right? To, to be open and listening. Um, and I, I think that's one of the things that comes with a whole month for pride is to be aware, right? Even if you're not involved in the community, to, to know that the community's there and to, to learn more right to to be open and and for us as you know essentially an advocacy group to make sure that other people know right and that the burden isn't just on the the queer community the christian community the queer christian community um and and so that's definitely knowledge i think is is a big part going forward thanks leah Anything else that we didn't get a chance to talk about that we want to say about pride, about being communities of faith in the Christian tradition, Jesus, any of those sort of big buckets? Is there, I know we could keep going on and on, of course, but are there, are there things that we want to, that we want to say and make sure that we share, you know, at this time and especially during pride month for the Presbytery? I think I'd love to say our table is wide and we want it to be even wider and mm -hmm. There are two communities I think of when I'm saying that one is people that aren't sure yet about homosexuality and trans folks, um, people that mm. have been raised like I was with theologies that, you know, lead you to believe that um, LGBTQ people or, or the LGBTQ behavior um, is sinful, um, that we are ready to engage with you um, and to hear you and to walk with you. I think sometimes it can feel like everybody in the room thinks this, but no one's talking about how they got there. And so people just walk away because they don't feel welcomed kind of on the journey. And so mm. Presbyterian Promise has always been committed to meeting people where they are. And that included, we were really active when there were churches that were leaving the PCUSA after some of these decisions, that it was a lot of Presbyterian Promise um, queer folks and allies that were a part of that process to meet with with some of those churches and try to see if there were any ways that they could stay or how we could remain in right relationship to them and so mm. i think if you are a parent whose child just came out and you're like whoa i never thought i'd have to deal with this but suddenly i'm in conflict or a grandparent or you yourself are are starting to realize you might be queer or trans and you haven't had access to narratives other than thinking that it's sin know that um, that we are here and ready to meet you with you where you are without judgment. Um, and then I'd also say that, you know, we have eight churches that are member churches, but every church can join. So, you know, what that involves is um, you have a representative from your church that serves on our board. And it means we invite you to join us in pride and you can advertise our events if that's something you're interested in. And it also means we can consult on issues. We can come to your youth group if they're wanting to talk about this. We can meet with your session if something comes up. We can give advice about how to think about bathrooms. Um, you don't have to be a member to ask for us to consult, but 
Um, th there's just a great sense of camaraderie in life that is present here. And as Shannon mentioned, we just had a new church join. And so you're never late to a party. Uh, this is a party that is unending. So come on over and join us and talk. We're here. Um, we feel very called to this work and we'd love for anyone who's listening to be a part of it. Thanks, Jenny. Thanks. And Ellen, I was just thinking, I should have brought it downstairs. It's sitting up next to my jewelry box in my bedroom. I was, I preached at your church a few Sundays ago and the new pins were handed Did out. Did you get the pride pin? Yeah. I got mm -hmm. your new pride pin. You know, yeah. you were talking about the rainbow yep. on the, um, uh, on the, you know, church the uh, sign out front, board yeah. out front, right? So it was this beautiful, uh, you know, pin of the uh you know looking you know the sanctuary and it's uh, in the pride color really well done i just want to say and um really it was fun watching them get handed out that sunday yeah. after worship they got mentioned during announcements and um people were putting them on and um just a really fun thing and it's it's they're really nice like you could wear them and then somebody would probably say like what's that what's that about mm -hmm. and because like the building is unusual too like it gives yeah. you a chance to say something about that but also remind people that your church is welcoming. It's like wearing the church sign like around with you. So I just want to say like a really cool piece of um, very subtle evangelism, but um, but also really clear at the same time and also very stylish. Uh, uh, the designer did a really cool job. So I should have brought that downstairs with me because I could have. Uh, so I can go go grab one. But yeah, it was designed yeah, by one, yeah. of, our, one, of, our, a couple one of our team. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was designed by one of our team members. So yeah, you know, artist, yeah. Um, yeah, really cool. Really, really cool. So thank and you. We handed those out at Norwalk Fairfield Pride uh, yeah. two weekends ago. And actually, I had two people come up to me while I was walking around with it on asking, oh, what's that? Where'd you get that? Yeah. I was like, from the Pride, the Presbyterian Promise Church <laughs> group over there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, and on those like symbols, we started handing out the more light Presbyterian pronoun uh, pins at Presbytery meetings a couple years ago, actually before the pandemic. And um, and then we've just we've always kept a supply and they're they're always available whenever we have in-person events. And one of our commissioners to General Assembly emailed me a few days ago and said, I know pins, you know, getting pins at GA is a thing. Can I take some of our Presbytery pins with me? Uh, like, how can you get them to me? And I said, well, actually, they're not our pins. They're more like Presbyterians pins. And we just use them because um, they're just well done. And why reinvent the wheel? Right. And they're just well, they're like, you know, they're just nicely designed and all of that. And I said, but, you know, more light's going to be at GA. So you'll get them there. And our commissioner was happy. But it was fun to kind of get that, like that our pins were um, even just those pronoun pins that we've handed out at in-person Presbytery meetings. Um, all of a sudden someone was like, oh, they thought that it was like our Presbytery pin. Let me take it to General Assembly next week. So um, so these things do then end up taking kind of a life of their own. And that's good because it begins to tell tell a story, which is really exciting. So thank you all for your witness, for your ministry. Um, I hope we can keep talking about these things uh, in the church. And I'm just really grateful for a Presbyterian promise. And congratulations on a big anniversary year, uh, 25 years. Uh, it's a great Ooh. thing to celebrate. And I'm so glad we had the opportunity to talk about Pride Month and how it connects to our faith and a little bit about our stories and to just know more about each other. And then also for folks who are listening to hear more about this ministry and within the Presbytery and the invita invitation to be a part of it, because that invitation is always um, open and welcoming. So, so grateful for each of you and for your ministry. And thank you so much for being part of our podcast and connecting our conversations. Thank you. And let me just say we have two events in September in Hartford and New Haven. You don't need to be from either to join us. So if you hear this and are like, I want to jump on board, um, contact us at presbyterianpromise at gmail.com. And we'd love to have you table with us. All are welcome. Fantastic. Thank you all so much. Thank you.